Morning. How are we? Everyone's okay? Well, it was, uh, what was that? So far? Well, I'm preaching against slander and gossip, so I guess maybe somebody will be offended by that. We'll find out, um, including me. Anyways, good morning, good to see you, and uh, we're looking forward to getting back into First Peter here together. Um, it was a good launch week. Thank you for all who came to Bible study. Uh, it's, still, it's still open. Uh, we're learning about the Holy Spirit together. Lots of good questions being asked, and so come on down. Monday at 7 on Zoom. Come on, you can go on Zoom. You're in, you're in your pajamas. Some people were eating dinner. Some were laying in bed looking up at their phone, all with their camera off, but nonetheless, you can come and join us for that. And of course, drop-in was great. Had probably 30, 35 kids. And if you haven't seen how the drop-in has changed since last year, I highly recommend you drop in just to come see all the amazing changes that have been made. And thank you for those who are working so hard on that. All right, so let's pray. And we will hop into, if I even have a remote here, to chapter two. And we're looking forward to seeing what God is going to do in our hearts and lives here together. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for your word, and thank you for the word that's going to be read here this morning. Uh, Lord, we don't understand everything we read. Um, Just like we learn in in adult Sunday school, uh, sometimes we need to not only hear it, but we need to be, we need to have it explained as well. And so, Lord, I certainly need to grow uh, in how I explain, but also in how I hear and how I understand. And so, thank you, God, for what you have for us here uh, this morning, and I certainly ask Holy Spirit trusting that you are in us, trusting that each believer here has you living inside of them, that we are connected as the body of Christ because you live in us. And we thank you that you are, are willing to speak to us. And that, that's not even the question. The question is, are we willing to listen? And so just challenge us this morning and help us to be what we need to be for you. In Jesus' name, amen. So First Peter, we've been talking about how we are, in many ways, pilgrims passing through foreign land passing through enemy territory. And of course, we've talked about how uh, this world is not our home. And there are things we... So we're not just waiting for the rapture is what I'm trying to say. We're not just hunkering down and building a bomb bunker and waiting for his return. No, we are actually doing things here. Uh, There are character qualities we need to exhibit in our lives. And so today we're going to talk about hindrances and hunger. We're going to talk about the things in our lives uh, that can hinder growth and the things that will encourage us uh, to grow. And so we're just going to jump right in here. And as we usually do, is we're going to read a little, and then we're going to talk a little, just like Ezra did in what we read in Adult Sunday School. We're going to read, and then we're going to give the sense of it, okay? And then we're going to apply it uh, to our lives. That's thousands of years. That's how they've been doing it. So here, and again, I don't know why he names these sins first. I don't know if he, he knew what was going on in these churches, but I suspect since this is general Christian teaching, this is all stuff that we struggle with. So we'll talk about each one here in a minute. So here's what he says in verse 1. Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking. Okay, so laying those things aside, let's talk about each one. What is malice? Malice is ill will. It is a uh, desire to injure. It's holding an old grudge and wanting to take revenge. Uh, One author said this about malice. There are persons we can meet who are so spiteful as to cause pain the moment you come into contact with them. Their lips distill malice And it seems the object of their life to inflict malignant wounds. You ever met a person like that? You meet them and they're just toxic. Yeah, they're full of malice. Well, he, he tells us to put away malice. Grudges and revenge have no place in the Christian's life. We are to leave vengeance to God as he is the only one who is able to deal with other people's sins. Romans 12, of course, we covered that when we were were in Romans. 17 to 19 is a good reminder for us, because again, naturally, we want to take revenge. He says this, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, 
I will repay, says the Lord. So as we said in Romans, is when we actually take revenge on people, we're taking something away from God that is rightfully his, which is vengeance against sin. Now, let's think about our own lives here. You might look in the mirror and, and you might not think of yourself as a very angry person. Uh, and maybe you feel as you contemplate in your own heart that you have no malice in you. But, <laughs> let me say this, it seems like there are some of us, and maybe all of us at times, who have found a way to cloak maliciousness in the veil of religion. Sadly, in my experience, I've found that some of the most religious of people are also some of the most malicious. You, maybe you know people who have mastered the act of punishing others with whom they disagree or with whom they feel has wronged them. Of course, as we've said, usually I've said this in the past, people who are hurt go on to hurt others, right? And so whether it's outright uh, vindictive grudges or simply attacking others out of our past hurt, both of those are wrong. And I would say for sure malice gets in the way of growth in our lives. Spurgeon said this, sin needs quenching in the Savior's blood, not concealing under the garb of religion. Okay, malice, deceit, as well he tells us to put away. Deceit uh, or guile, some, some versions will say guile, really it's dishonesty. It's not being trustworthy. It's someone who is insincere. And so it's important here as well, he says, all deceit. So not just in the big ways, but in the small ways, we are to not be deceitful. Right? And so it isn't good enough that we defraud or rip people off a little bit less. <laughs> it's that we don't do any of that at all. He mentions here as well hypocrisy. Hypocrisy was a problem 2,000 years ago. So it's nothing new. Right? The word hypocrite, of course, comes up from that word really literally meaning a stage actor. It's somebody who is fake. It's somebody who would put on different masks on stage and play different characters. So to be a hypocrite means that you claim to be one thing and you are in reality something else entirely. That you can pretend and put on a good show, but that what you present to others is not who you really are. That's what a hypocrite is. And, and this is important to note as well. People aren't hypocrites by accident. A hypocrite is someone who intends to deceive. This is something that a person does willingly and knowingly, and it is often done for their own personal benefit and gain. On the contrary, Christians should be genuine with each other, right? We don't need to look perfect to be a part of a church. We can be ourselves and admit with everybody else in the room that I need a savior, amen? That it's actually okay uh, to not be okay, okay? But again, hypocrisy is a problem, I think, in many people's lives. Envy is a sin uh, that is much deeper and darker than it appears. One author, maybe overly dramatically, but I think correctly, uh, says this about envy. Envy deforms our natures. It makes a man suspicious, malicious, contentious. It makes us to provoke, backbite, and practice evil against our neighbors. It's in our jealousy of good things happening to other people while feeling sorry for ourselves and the lives we have that envy can become so destructive. It can literally eat away at the life and the soul of a person. And so again, don't compare yourself with others. This person has this and I don't. It doesn't matter. This is the lot God has given you in your life. Be content with that. Okay? Thankfulness is actually a very good antidote uh, for envy understanding and having perspective. He mentions here as well slander. Slander. So gossip in the church is one thing. Talking about people when they're not in the room. <clears throat> gossip is actually one of the evils listed in Romans 1 that sends people to hell, so it's actually a very serious sin. But slander is actually far worse because slander is far worse because it isn't just talking about others behind their back. It's actually attacking a person's character and reputation. Okay, and it's interesting, again, because many of these words we've read in verse 1 are connected. The person who decides to slander someone has malice in their heart <coughs> or deceit, or, or we speak evil of those whom we're jealous of. So this is kind of a big ball of ugly sin. It's all kind of combined. Okay, one author said this, Maybe I'll say this. Um, 
Slander is one of those things we can cloak in a religious garb uh, to make it sound a bit, a bit less evil. And so instead of criticizing somebody, you can walk up and say, you know, I have a concern, but it's really a criticism. Or you're at a prayer meeting and the person isn't there and you say, you know, I have a concern for this person. Well, actually, you just want to gossip about what you heard. Okay. One author said this, there are many ways uh, of speaking evil of others. <laughs> Oh, man, this is so true. You may insinuate doubts as to their piety. Man, you may ask questions about them, which will lead others to ask questions still more significant. And it is, it is an easy thing to blast the character of another while it is very difficult thing. It is a, it is a very difficult thing to repair the injury. How, 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 fat, how long does it take to tear somebody down? How long does it take to build them back up? Maybe you never will. That's the danger of slander. Ephesians 4.29, Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Augustine said this about all these things. He said, Malice delights in another's hurt. Envy pines at another's good. Deceit imparts duplicity to the heart. Hypocrisy or flattery imparts duplicity to the tongue. Evil speakings wound the character of another. So those are some things that can hinder us. What are some things that we can do to grow? Here's what he says in verse 2 and 3. As newborn babes, (coughs) desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. So all normal babies are hungry for milk. New moms, new dads, you know. Babies hungry for their milk, what do they tell you? (laughs) Nothing? They're quite loud. They tell you they're hungry. It's like, okay. Or when you're changing the diaper, they're doing the Olympic spin. (laughs) Right? Oh, man. And we're still experiencing that with our baby. Okay? But here's here's the question. If there's a baby that isn't hungry for milk, there's something wrong. And there's actually some cases where babies actually aren't hungry for milk. There's something seriously wrong with them, okay? And so what we would say here um, is that if we are Christians, if we are babes in Christ or even mature in Christ, if we have no desire for the word, what's wrong with us? And it's interesting here, this word for desire is very strong. Uh, Desiring the milk of the word, it is used used for man's deepest longing for God. As the tear pants for water, so my soul pants for you, O God. So again, Spurgeon said, it is a sign of declining health in a Christian when he does not love the means of grace. The, The Bible, of course, being a major means of grace. Okay? So hunger for the word. We talk about that all the time here. Verse 4. Jesus is precious, coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also as living stones. So he always gives this this explanation, him, and and Paul actually says the same thing. Jesus is this cornerstone of the foundation, and all of us are stones that are being built together to build this big spiritual building. We're not a temple like in the Old Testament. We are a a spiritual temple. Uh, He uses this reference many, many times. Okay. Are being built up, he says, a, a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, speaking of Jesus, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, He again quotes the Old Testament, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. So again, we can talk about the spiritual temple we're being formed into, the body of Christ. I really want to focus on, just because I'm here and I'm doing it, it's interesting here in verse 4 what he says. It says that Jesus is chosen and precious to God. Well, we talked about the Trinity on Monday, well, on, on Bible study. I thought Jesus is God. So how could God be precious to God? Good question. 
This again gives us a glimpse of the Trinity, that God the Father has an eternal relationship with Jesus the Son. And the fact that Jesus is precious to God makes his sacrifice, which we'll talk more about next week, all the more amazing. Because God gave us what was precious to him for us. That's pretty cool. He says here as well, those who, put, uh, those who believe in him will not be put to shame. Right? And so the world definitely puts us to shame. Luckily, God says he will not put us to shame. And that's whose opinion matters the most. As well here, we're challenged and we're told that Jesus is precious to those who believe in him. And so do you value what God values? He thinks Jesus is precious. Is he precious to you? Spurgeon said this, is Jesus precious to your soul? Is Jesus precious to your soul? Remember, on your answer to this question depends your condition. You believe if he is precious to you, but if he is not precious, then you are not believers, and you are condemned already because you believe not on the Son of God. So again, if he has touched your life, if he has changed you, if he has saved you, he is precious to you. If you think he is neither here nor there, there's a problem in your heart and in your life. Verse 8, Jesus is a stumbling block to those who refuse to believe in him. It's interesting here, he says, a couple of things we're going to cover here. He says, they stumble being disobedient to the word to which they were also appointed. Okay, so we say, well, they're stumbling. It's not their fault. Well, he tells them why they stumble over Jesus. They are disobedient to the word. And again, there is a contrast here uh, between believers and non-believers. One uh, side finds Jesus precious that is the Christian, while the others are offended by him and hate him. And again, the world doesn't stumble over the gospel by accident. No, they stumble because they are disobedient to the word. That same word that we are to desire and grow in, the world is disobedient to. And so they will not believe, not because they can't, but because they won't. They do not want to submit uh, the unbeliever to the authority of God's word and would rather go to hell than humbly submit to what God says. Isn't that true? Of course, they think that's where the party is. That's where they're wrong. The end of verse 8 is a bit of a difficult verse. Look what he says. They're disobedient to the word to which (coughs) it says, they also were appointed. Hmm. On the one hand, people reject Christ because they are disobedient to the word and they are responsible for their choices. And yet right alongside of that choice to reject God, we read that this is what they were appointed to. (laughs) Jude 1 verse 4 says this, For certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly men who turned the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, let me give you my opinion. (laughs) I know some of you will disagree, and that's okay. We're a family. I'll read some commentaries that agree with me. At least it's not just me. I don't think this means that God made mankind sin or that God is the author of sin. We need to be very, very careful when speaking of God that we don't make him the ultimate cause of sin that he's the author of it, and ultimately it would fall at his feet and it would be him to blame. What would that say of God's holy character if he was the author of sin, if he made you do it? Or he made the devil do it to make you do it? There's a problem with that. Most commentaries that I read agree that a person's rejection of the truth is not ultimately God's fault. Here are some authors and what they said about this verse. Into this stumbling and disobedience... They were permitted by God to fall. Okay, so it's a permission, not a uh, necessarily a ordination. They were appointed, another author says, not that they should sin, but that by sinning they should be punished. One other, one, other, one other author said, not that God ordains or appoints them to sin, but they are given up to the fruit of their own ways according to the eternal counsel of God. So in my opinion, it is the punishment that has been appointed by God, not the sin itself. Even if it was the sin, the Bible still holds us accountable for our sin. One author said this as well, The lost shall lay all the blame of their ruin on their own sinful perversity, not on God's decree. 
The saved shall ascribe all the merit of their salvation to God's electing love and grace. And finally, one, one, other, uh, one other author said, No man who disbelieves and rejects the gospel should take refuge in this verse as an excuse. In other words, an unbeliever should not read this verse and say, Well, I'm rejecting God because he appointed me to it. God will not accept that excuse on Judgment Day. Clear as mud, right? <laughs> Clear as mud. All right, verse 9. Sometimes I just like to let things hang because then you can go study on your own and learn and grow. Isn't that great? If, I, if you ever get a pastor after me or if I start saying that I have all the answers, please remove me. <laughs> I do not have all the answers, believe me. Okay, verse 9. Years ago I thought I did, but as I get older I realize I know very little. He says here, and you'll, you'll, you'll notice some of the language here, very um, Old Testament Israel, very interesting using some of that same language to us that God would use of the Jews. So again, talking of the new covenant. But you, he says, are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Again, we're not a country of Christians, but the church is considered a holy nation. His own special people. So he's telling them, look, you are special to God, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light who once were not the people of God, but who are now the people of God, who, who, had, who, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. You could go to Ephesians chapter 2, very similar language is used there. And again, I think this was used maybe in particular because the Jews were persecuting them, and so Peter is telling them, look, what they used to be and what they're mad at you about, this is who you are now. You are now that holy nation under God. Verse 11, beloved, he says, I beg you. I beg you, he says, and I, I beg you as well, as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak, and Gentiles speaks of just the unbelieving world in general. I don't think that means that this audience is only Jews. I think it's, again, just speaking of the outsiders, the non-Christians. That, that when they speak evil against you, not if, when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. It's very interesting. Early on in Christian history, the Roman Empire and the, the pagans would claim all sorts of terrible things about Christians. When Christians would celebrate communion, they would say, Christians are just a bunch of cannibals. They're drinking blood. They're sacrificing babies. And they said these terrible things about Christians. But it's interesting, as time goes on and a couple of hundred years passed, you read some of the Roman writings about Christians and... It's interesting, they accuse Christians of being superstitious, and they call us atheists because we don't believe in all their gods, and they call us all sorts of things, but they do not accuse Christians of having bad character <laughs> or of being immoral. It's interesting that the Christians had a good uh, reputation among the Gentiles in that way. <clears throat> all right, verse 11. You had some fleshly lusts this week, did you? Temptations, battles... You know exactly what, you're, what I'm talking about when we talk about sinful natures and sinful desires of warring against our very soul. Galatians 5, 16 and 17 says the same thing. He says, I say then walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another. That literally means permanently entrenched in battle with one another. There's two ditches and they're there and they're shooting back and forth. It's a battle that isn't going to end till we die, <clears throat> which sucks, but it is what it is. He says, so that you do not do the things that you wish. So when we sin, we're not doing what we want. When we sin, we're doing the thing that is contrary to our nature. But that battle, Galatians says, and we're told here as well, is a war inside of us. Anybody have that war this week in, in themselves? Just me? Blaine and me? <laughs> Blaine and I? Proper grammar, Right? So the new creature is who we really are. The flesh is who we used to be, but both exist inside of us at the same time. And you think, well, God, it would have been nice if you would have just sucked out that flesh and given me just a, only a new nature. Yeah, but we wouldn't really be dependent on him each day if we didn't have a flesh, would we? I wonder if that's a reason why. 
Well, we are just as capable of sin as we've always been. In fact, as we grow in our faith, I think we become more conscious of sin. We look in the mirror and we go, 20 years in, God, why am I worse than ever? Just exposing what we've always been. One incredible thing the Holy Spirit does in our lives as we grow is that he takes the joy out of our sin. It just doesn't feel good anymore. In fact, it makes us want to puke. That's how sin makes us feel. When we sin and we do, the Spirit crushes us with conviction and drives us back to the Savior. And so when that conviction comes, dear Christian, do not ignore it. Do not quench it. Do not grieve him who lives inside of you. We'll talk about this Monday for Bible study. The Holy Spirit is not a force or an energy or a power. The Holy Spirit is a person who is indwelling you. And so to grieve him, how do you grieve an energy or a force? When we sin, we, we break the heart of the one who's living inside of us. That person of the Trinity who is represented as a dove at the baptism of Jesus. As well, in verse 12, he says, our honorable conduct in the world will glorify God. They will speak bad of us. I know. I remember years ago, I'm not sure if I should even share this, but years ago, I was working at McDonald's, and, and of course, I'm a Christian guy. I'm, I'm single. I'm waiting for marriage for all the marital stuff. One guy started saying rumors of me that I was, you know, sleeping with somebody else at the work, and da, 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 and, and people looked at him, and they're like, Kevin would never do that. And it was funny almost because I had a reputation that was hopefully good. You could nail me for some things, but you couldn't nail me for that. And so our honorable conduct in the world should shut their mouths when they say, say bad things about us, okay? It was a bit of a weird story, but that's working with a bunch of teenagers, okay? <laughs> Back in the day. Let's do some application. I feel like I say this every week, but I'll say it again. Our sin must die or everything else around us will. The sins mentioned in verse 1 are not only destructive uh, destructive for us and our marriages and our families, they are destructive maybe even especially for the church family. And it's hard to think of sins like malice and deceit and slander even being a part of the Christian church, and yet obviously they are. Sin is deceptive and cunning and stealthy and incredibly dangerous, and any of us are able to fall into it at any time. Many folks stuck with these kinds of sinful attitudes might even mean well or seem to mean well, but the road to hell is paid with good intentions. The reality of sin is that it must be killed in our lives or it will end up killing everyone and everything else around us. Okay? Jesus uses that very harsh language. If your right hand causes you to sin, what do you do for it? You cut it off and throw it from you. Why? It's better to go to heaven with only one hand than to go to hell with your whole body. So Jesus tells us to take sin very, very seriously. Paul in Galatians, he refers to sin as a bit of yeast that works its way through the dough. And so it's just a little bit of sin, but if it's not dealt with, it grows and gets more and more ugly, becomes a monster. And so if sin is left undealt with in your life or in the church, it will grow and it will be like a cancer that will spread. Sin has to be eradicated in the church. And so maybe you're convicted of malice or deceit or or hypocrisy or envy or slander, Whatever those things are in your life, they have to die. You have to put them to death. You have to put them to death. And here's the thing. We wrongly assume it's the big sins that wreck churches. It's actually the small sins that wreck churches. Things like gossip. Okay? We must crave the milk of the word and grow in our faith. So sin is a hindrance. The word of God will help us to grow. Let's talk about that. Hunger for the word. Three points. You read your Bible, if you're just like, I don't read my Bible and I have no plan to, then you can just go do something else for the next five minutes. This isn't for you. But if you are hungry and willing to read, here's some tips maybe for you to help you grow. Number one, the word must be taken into the soul by hearing and reading. So we actually have to read it. We have to hear it. It could be preaching. It could be our audio Bible. It could be reading it ourselves. Okay? As well... This word must be digested in the soul by reflection and prayer. One of the first verses I ever memorized, Psalm 119.11, I've hidden your word in my heart so that I would not sin against you. So it isn't enough. And we saw this this morning for uh, Sunday school as well. They didn't just stand for six hours and read the Old Testament law for six hours. He explained it. And then later on, they took some time to reflect and repent and and think. Okay, And so the word, uh, you know, maybe you, you read your chapter a day. That's great. But how, did, you, did you stop to think about it and reflect and meditate in the biblical sense? 
And finally, this is very important, the word must be incorporated in the soul by holy activities and habits. Okay? James uh, talks about those who read and hear the Bible, but who don't go on to do anything about it. He tells us not just to be hearers of the word, but doers. This is why sitting under preaching is so dangerous for all of us, because if we hear it and don't do anything, we're in danger. God is going to hold us accountable for what we know. It'd be better for us to not know, Second Peter is going to tell us, than to, to know and not do anything about it. In fact, James has this amazing picture. It's so simple. But he says, a person who hears the word and doesn't do anything about it is like a person who looks in the mirror and then looks away and immediately forgets what they look like. And you think, that's strange. Why would anybody do that? How is that even possible? Exactly. How could we hear the word of God and not change and not respond? Okay. And finally, I'll ask you the question, is Jesus your treasure? We're told here in this passage that Jesus is precious to God and to those who believe in him. And so here's a, person for, here's a question for us to ponder. If a person is consumed by the sins of malice and slander and so forth, is that person, person viewing and treating Jesus as the precious treasure that he actually is? Can a person both tear others down and at the same time also treasure Jesus for who he really is to them? I don't think it's possible. Okay, Matthew 6, 19 to 21, Jesus said, Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasure in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Look what he says in verse 21. Such a timeless verse. For where your treasure is, what's precious to you, there your heart will be also. And so if our hearts are full of anger and bitterness and hurt and spite and revenge and ill will towards others, we are giving evidence of what our treasure is, and it's not Jesus. See, you and I can claim as much as we want that Jesus is our treasure, but the reality of what we deem precious and valuable is where our heart is. Jesus says elsewhere, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. We're always told in our culture, you can't judge a book by its cover. Indeed, you can. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And if it's speaking vile things and slander and gossip and tearing people down, what in the world is in your heart? Maybe that's scary. If all your mouth does is tear down others, it tells us a lot about what's inside of your heart. And so what do you treasure? What do you deem valuable and worthy of your time and attention? What is precious to you? If you say, I have no time to read the Bible, you are showing by those words, by that action, you do not view the Bible as precious to you. And thus, knowledge of Jesus as well. The evidence is in where your heart resides and what comes out of your heart. And know that if anything else other than Jesus, whether person, place, or thing, replaces him as what's precious to you, that thing, that person, that place, it will someday be nothing more than dust in light of eternity. Not that our spouse or kids or jobs don't matter, but in the busyness, and I know we're very busy, where is Jesus in the scheme of things? Is Jesus precious to you? Is he your treasure? And if you claim that's true in your life, how is your life reflecting that to others? Okay? Let's pray. Thank you, dear God, for your word and for how you challenge us here this morning. We certainly look at the many things we treasure in this world, things that are a temporary, things that ultimately don't really matter. We find so little time, God, for you. And we may say with our lips, Jesus, that you are precious to us, that we treasure you, and yet by our actions, by our thoughts, even by our words and how we speak about others, we prove uh, just how far we have to go in our growth and in our faith. And so, Lord, if there are, there are ways we had to be convicted this morning, <coughs> I pray, Spirit, that you would convict them. Um, if there's areas we have to repent here this morning, I pray that we would. Uh, for those who need encouragement here this morning, maybe they're just hanging on by a thread this week. I pray for you to come and encourage them uh, this morning and even this afternoon and this evening. I pray that you would give us the strength we need God, to be able to serve you this week in whatever way uh, you've asked us to serve you. 
We know there are moms that have to stay home with fussy babies. There are men who have to work really hard during harvest time. There are those who are sick or ill or lonely. We know each of us, Lord, has a cross to bear. We know that the only cross isn't just persecution and death, but there are many other things that Christians can suffer through as we are uh, sojourners and pilgrims in this world. And so, Father, I do ask genuinely that you would encourage our hearts here this morning, that you would lift us up, that you would give us joy uh, in serving you, in serving your church, and in serving others. And I just pray, Lord, uh, for your blessing over each person here, that those who don't know you would come to know you, that those who do know you would would desire to know you more, and that all of that will be done uh, for your praise and honor and glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.